Yes, thank you so much, Bob. And it's a, a pleasure from the, the, my final presentation um, to this morning to talk to you about maintenance. Um, I, I frankly will, will find this particularly difficult <laughs> because I think that, uh, and I actually perhaps have uh, cheated a little bit by changing my title slightly um, by saying lenalidomide should be the backbone because I think that what I hope to convince you is that lenalidomide is a very rational backbone agent as part of maintenance, and what I'm sure Suzanne will do beautifully is exemplify why um, going forward um, that um, would um, be, um, uh, you know, that this, as I say, should be a backbone to which other drugs, antibodies, proteasome inhibitors should be perhaps selectively added. And I think that you'll find that Suzanne will, and I will essentially agree. So in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of build the platform for this discussion in the following context. When we think about the current paradigm of initial treatment, um, we think about transplant eligible and transplant ineligible. And I would argue that a lot of the information that you've heard this morning and that you'll hear more of um, over the course of the coming months will suggest to you that this kind of uh, uh, definition of, of one versus the other perhaps is a little bit artifactual now or, or, or outmoded and that it will be transplant will be a part of our therapeutic armamentarium with a rationale of one size does not necessarily fit all. Irrespective of that, maintenance or continuous therapy will be part of what we do. And so what I wanted to do in the sharing with you this discussion and the focus of transplant is to give you the data that supports the use of lenalidomide maintenance post-transplant. But I do want to say one thing, which is that after initial induction remission therapy with, for example, RVD, we've seen certainly, both in the context of the clinical trials that we've done as well as our own practice, the importance of lenalidomide maintenance as part of continuous therapy, both in initial treatment and, of course, in the relapse setting. Um, but also the fact that what you induce with and what you intensify with does influence your ability to tolerate maintenance differently. And I think one thing to say is watch this space in the transplant studies to see how, for example, in our own trial, lenalidomide maintenance performs for the non-transplant arm compared to the transplant arm. That's not something that's in the French study, and I'll touch on that a bit later to any meaningful degree, because the lenalidomide maintenance is limited to one year which I think is a major difference between the French study and our own. Anyway, I just want to share that with you because I think the importance is what can we give over time and the ability to keep your pedal to the metal um, with your therapy. So treatment goals following induction therapy for myeloma. Obviously, we want to improve PFS, no question. But we obviously also want to improve OS. And does improved PFS truly result in improved OS? That's a critical question. And is a risk-adapted approach justified? And I would suggest to you that, um, from my perspective, this is where I think Suzanne and I will be absolutely on the same page in our discussion this morning. It probably is. So the question is not that you don't give any one therapy. You give a baseline of treatment, and I'll argue it's lenalidomide, uh, with a bisphosphonate in the appropriate setting. And beyond that is a question of what you add. Now, this is the critical point. Continued therapy following induction, timing, duration, intensity, toxicity, to avoid treatment fatigue. Easy to deliver, convenient, improves PFS and OS. So these are the critical points of the discussion uh, to support lenalidomide as a backbone. Um, now, obviously, we know that novel agent consolidation therapy can improve depth of response, prolongs PFS as consolidation. And to come a little bit in a moment to going into more detail, especially around the CTN trial, to maybe challenge that a little bit. Having said that, I wanted to emphasize this particular study because this is best data that we have to support consolidation so far. And what we have from our own French-American study is that consolidation does improve depth and quality of response as well. So I didn't want to be uh, remiss in not mentioning the importance of consolidation post-intensification prior to maintenance. To support that is data from uh, the French study that was given uh, at the ASH meeting a couple of years ago by Michelle before the publication of the paper yesterday to exemplify uh, that point. Now, in terms of the CTN trial, I want to show this to you because I think it's really interesting in how it gives you the backbone or rather the effect of lenalidomide maintenance until progression as a real equalizer. This was presented um, at the ASH meeting as a late-breaking abstract by Dr. Ed Stadmauer. Just to remind you what it was, it was the stamina trial uh, and this essentially uh, is this trial in which patients were registered, randomized, and then assigned to lenalidomide maintenance, RVD times four, and then melphalan. And then in this context, the question was two transplants versus RVD consolidation versus len maintenance, and then len maintenance to follow. 
So essentially, as we went forward with this, um, the construct was initially that lenalidomide maintenance would be given for three years uh, when the trial was originally designed, uh, with 10 milligrams going up to uh, 15 milligrams continuously after three months based upon CLGB 100-104. However, when the data from CLGB 100-104 came through and was so mm -hmm. supportive, particularly of, of clinical benefit, both with PFS and OS, and we'll come to that in a moment, then it was extended until progression, which I think was a critical move. Um, there was a high risk versus standard risk stratification signed equally to all of the respective arms. And this is basically the regimens prior to transplant, um, RVD, Cybor-D, RD, and bortezomib index. Compliance with interventions really relevant here. As you can see, the auto followed by auto was the least compliant. About a third of patients couldn't go on to second transplant. And then in the context of the RVD consolidation followed by R maintenance, about 12% of patients couldn't do that. Conversely, however, for maintenance with lenalidomide alone, going straight into it, there was just a 5% non-compliance rate. So I think that's really very interesting. And again, supportive of the argument that, you know, in the setting of, of, a, of, a, of a backbone agent, len is ideal. Now, what happened in terms of progression-free survival? Well, this is the really interesting one. As you can see, no difference at all between the three arms with auto followed by straight len maintenance performing just as well uh, as auto RVD uh, and the tandem autologous transplant with essentially no difference uh, in 38-month progression-free survival estimates between all three arms. And if you look at overall survival, these curves are almost superimposable. Um, so exactly here, as you can see, uh, great survivals, actually, excellent results, very similar to what we see with uh, IFM, um, but at the same time, uh, no difference depending on what you do. Um, sorry, just going this. Right, okay, now this is one interesting one. I do want to bring a caveat in, to, and I hope this, this helps Suzanne, actually, because the one thing I want to estimate here is just beware of the high risk, because as you can see, the incorporation of the bortezomib in this high risk group doesn't reach statistical significance but it's about a six-month difference compared to auto-auto, and it's actuarially an eighth-month difference to auto followed by lens. So that, I think, is an important caveat. So the preliminary conclusions, in the era of IMIDs and PIs, basically lenalidomide maintenance is an equalizer. You can just use it until progression, and it does the job. We do need to know a bit more about overall survival, and I do want to mention the caveat of the high-risk group. Very importantly, compliance matters. And for example, one of the reasons one might argue that the second transplant didn't do so well, is not least of which because a third of patients couldn't go on to it. Now, what about the best data for lenalidomide maintenance post-transplant? Well, it's here, led by my colleague, Phil McCarthy, and something we're very proud of from the Alliance. This was an intergroup study blessed with the joining of the CTN. Once the CTN joined us, as well as our partners in SWOG, um, who, were, who were study centers that would uh, join this trial, as well as uh, ECOG, we went to the races and completed the trial. The time to progression analysis originally you may be very familiar with. Essentially, it was doubled with lenalidomide maintenance compared to placebo. And very importantly, in the US trial, there was a survival benefit that kept our spirits alive because you may remember there was a very large push from Europe that perhaps lenalidomide maintenance was a double-edged sword. Uh, and in that context, there was no survival benefit and a real scare around second cancers that could have sort of stopped everything in its tracks. Well, I think in that context, the lenalidomide maintenance meta-analysis is something to be really uh, 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 proud of in the myeloma community because this represented the leadership of Michelle Attal, Antonio and others coming together um, to really look at this question properly um, with the support of, of Celgene as our pharma partner. And basically what was looked at here was lenalidomide maintenance across the major trials um, that could uh, give us a clue as to the survival benefit of this point or rather this approach. Uh, and this is basically how the study was performed, summarized below in these little boxes. And the studies included in the meta-analysis were CLGB 100-104, IFM 2005-02, which was the trial which stopped maintenance at around two years, didn't show a survival benefit, and also had the scare around uh, second cancers. But I would emphasize we saw a similar signal in 100-104, but perhaps to a lesser degree, and that may reflect the fact that chemotherapy was used predominantly in 2005-02 as an induction, uh, much less so for 100-104. Jemima Antonio's work uh, also provided the other major component to the meta-analysis. Uh, and this is, again, just bringing out the differences between the trials. 
Um, obviously, uh, with the early reads, we continued lenalidomide, crossed over patients from placebo to len in the CLGB 101-04. In the French study, it was basically stopped in its tracks, uh, and in the Italian study, treatment continued um, per protocol. This is basically the comparison of the two groups. This is the survival benefit that was seen. Now, in practical terms, I always find it difficult to sort of understand these curves, but the median gain uh, in progression free, uh, sorry, in, in overall survival um, is around two and a half years um, based upon this analysis. So that, I think, is very helpful. It's around 2.4, to be precise, uh, over that time frame. And if you look at the subgroup analysis, <coughs> lenalidomide obviously wins here, uh, as one might expect. Um, but having said that, um, there are some groups in whom clearly we could do better, and this again, I hope, um, helps uh, Suzanne's presentation by emphasizing that in high risk, you may need to do better. Uh, and if you look at prior induction subgroups, it all looks about the same, which is great. In other words, induction doesn't change how things do. And this is probably the most important slide, where if you pull the analysis, you can see using the hazard ratios that we've got a very strong signal in support of lenalidomide maintenance until progression. Um, if you look at the second primary question, it's important, and I think the critical point here, though, is that competing causes of death far outweigh the risk of lenalidomide versus the benefit it confers in terms of anti-myeloma effect. Having said that, I think we will show you data in a minute to support that the primary driver of this, in my view, whilst len is important, the primary driver is genotoxic damage from melphalan, and we'll come to that in a moment. So the conclusions are lenalidomide maintenance, so clearly improves overall survival, uh, is feasible for long-term disease control, the overall survival benefit outweighs the risk of developing second cancers, lenalidomide maintenance should arguably be then considered a standard of care, and to support that, of course, we had the FDA approval of the same um, earlier um, this year. So what in terms of future directions? A couple of points to make to further support the argument. This trial is something that we're... Uh, very honored to be part of. It's been a phenomenal team effort. It's around 60 centers across the United States partnered with the, uh, our French colleagues. Um, this slide's kind of fun because it's actually a, a, fr a French boat in the back there of girls. And this is the US boat up the front here. And you can see the French boat actually is ahead of the US boat. And I have to tell you, they did actually beat the US boat. But the funny bit about it is that's my daughter in the point of the uh, boat there. So anyway, there we are. But anyway, suffice to say, this is the US determination trial. And again, with the CTN's involvement here, we've been able to take this into overdrive. And we're almost fully accrued. We're at around 700 patients enrolled and around 680 randomized, 720 to randomize. And I actually want to especially acknowledge colleagues who are with me today, Bob and Suzanne, who are participants in this trial, as well as others in the room, because um, it's been a phenomenal effort. Now, where does this lead us? Well, the question that I emphasize this trial is because of the randomization between melphalan early versus late. Very, very important, because we'll better understand this second primary issue, not least, as well as the benefit of transplant versus not. The critical point in the US trial is that we continue lenalidomide maintenance until progression. The French, in their study, stopped at one year. Moreover, there's a very comprehensive effort of MRD and also phenotypic and genotypic characterization of the disease across both trials, led by my colleague Nikhil Munchi and Ave Ave Loiseau. And this teamwork between Ave and Nikhil has been phenomenal, and I think will generate a whole host of information that will help us going forward. My point here is to go back to the IFM paper, which you saw earlier, and just bring to your attention, obviously, no difference in overall survival, but a big difference in terms of PS, which I think is relevant and warrants careful ana analysis. But also this, the MRD negative versus positive outcomes. One thing I want to share with you, though, is the lenalidomide maintenance stops at one year. And what is clear from the analysis is the events kick off after that time. Clearly, there's a preponderance of events after lenalidomide finishes at one year, and that may be very relevant to these curves. The other point I wanted to make is the impact of salvage therapy. And I would argue here that lenalidomide maintenance provides you with a good platform for going forward with salvage because you haven't burnt too many bridges before. But I want to be a bit careful with this because I think, again, I don't want people to go away with the argument that less is more. I would just simply argue that lenalidomide does appear not to compromise in either arm um, where you go in terms of salvage. What's also critical in this study, though, is this which is the issue of second cancers. And if you look here, and actually look at the analysis here, which is probably the most relevant, which is the hematologic signal, it's early and it's a very small number, but the ratio is obvious. Basically, four cases of AML to one case in, in the RBD group, um, and in fact, 
a, uh, another case of MDS versus one uh, in the RVD group. So this signal, although small, unfortunately a very rare number of patients, so overall not a, a sto showstopper, is something we need to watch. The original analysis from the IFM was six to one i.e. six cases of MDS AML to one case uh, in the RVD group. That changed with proper auditing and censoring, but having said all of that, this signal is something we just have to be careful about as we go forward. And it certainly does suggest that lenalidomide, because lenalidomide maintenance was the same in both arms here, uh, is not the prime mover and shaker perhaps of this, and that's certainly supported by um, data from Antonio in older patients. So my concluding comments would be summarized richly here, that as we think about the tapestry of novel agents and immune therapies, my only point here is that lenalidomide maintenance not only really matters as a platform and should be considered a standard of care, both post-transplant and I would argue in the non-transplant setting, but very importantly, it provides a platform upon which we can reliably add these new agents. And hopefully that will um, provide a nice segue um, for uh, Suzanne. Thank you for your attention.